I am a gardener. At least I think I can honestly stand here and say that to you this morning. I used to be the opposite of that statement. I killed everything I touched when it came to plants. You didn't even want me planting flowers. Now, I don't know if it is about patience or maturity or maybe the help that I had in my gardening this year, probably the latter, if we're honest. But what I do know is that there is a garden on my back deck right now. And even more amazingly, this group of big pots and large plastic containers is actually bearing fruit. Well, vegetables, mainly, but it's bearing a lot of them. Now, I was hoping for a few tomatoes, if I was lucky. I certainly never expected the plethora of plants that have grown, things like tomatoes and beans and lima beans and strawberries and peppers, and I could keep on going, but I wouldn't want to brag. I am certainly too humble for that. <laughs> but there's just so much growing, you know? So much that I'm not sure what to do with my rainbow of tomatoes, my yellow ones and my purple ones and my red ones. There are a lot of meals at my house consisting of tomatoes. I eat a lot of tomatoes and cottage cheese or tomatoes and homegrown basil and mozzarella. And I learned how to make bruschetta last week because I got bored of those things. When I say I have a lot, I mean I literally cannot figure out what to do with those tomatoes. Now this morning, some people reminded me that I, they would take some off of my hands, and um, I'll certainly keep that in mind. But I have to say, growing these plants this year did take work. It took time and research and physical labor. The soil couldn't till itself. The seeds couldn't plant themselves. They needed love and care and tender hands. The soil needs a gardener, someone to till the earth to plant the seeds. Regardless of where seed is sown, it must be just that, sown. It takes someone to do it. Just as in our gospel lesson today, regardless of where the seed falls, the sower must actually sow the seed. And it is often, I think, that we are surprised about where seeds fall, about what is good soil and what is rocky soil. Take Jacob, for instance, son of Isaac, grandson of Abraham, two very God-fearing men. Abraham went to extremes to obey God. Because of it, Abraham was blessed, a blessing which then passed down to his son Isaac. And then when Isaac and Rebekah couldn't conceive, Isaac prayed. And lo and behold, they conceived. Not just one, but two. They had twins. But we hear that from the beginning, the twins wrestled, foreshadowing the struggles to come in their lives. These two, Jacob and Esau, two nations, Israel and Edom, would have their share of conflict, and probably the share of many others as well. Now Esau, the firstborn, destined to serve his younger brother, and Jacob, the heel grabber, destined to be a usurper of power, to always want more than what he had. So we have Jacob, who isn't exactly what seems like the perfect example of soil, of good soil. We might wonder why he's favored by God, why his descendants are the ones that become the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob is greedy, after all. He wants more. He tricks Esau out of his birthright, out of his inheritance, and later out of his blessing. Though, if we're being honest, it isn't like Esau tried very hard to keep said birthright. Hungry, famished, he says. He was caught up in his earthly and immediate needs. He wasn't really thinking of the future. And Jacob saw this, and he sure did take advantage. Our heel grabber usurped the birthright right out from under of a willing Esau. Always wanting more, seemingly never happy with what he has, he isn't a great example of how to act either. He doesn't seem like the nice and rich soil that God would choose to sow seed into. 
Even so, God chose to seed, to sow seed there. Now, up until this point, Abraham's line is pretty singular. It goes down, and then we have Jacob and Esau, and then with Jacob, it spans out. And Jacob's children become the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob is God's chosen one. But why Jacob? Well, sometimes God has plans that we are incapable of understanding. Here, it seems like neither Jacob nor Esau are really worthy of being the chosen especially Jacob, who wasn't even born first with the birthright. But God doesn't really pay attention to that. Instead, he went ahead and turned everything upside down, flipping tables, you might say, and he showed us that it isn't about us. Jacob is God's chosen twin. Jacob is Israel, regardless of what he's done. But he is made weaker by societal standards, He was the second child, so he didn't have the birthright, and therefore worthy of God's favor. God makes Jacob good soil, because God will plant seed where God wants to plant seed. What we do isn't all about us, but it's actually God working through each of us. God's promise is passed from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, and so it passes to us. And with that blessing, we get the promise that we are not alone, that we don't have to go through this life alone. We have help from our God. All we are and all we have comes from God, so we give it back to the glory of God. Now, we've been singing the doxology at the presentation lately. You know, praise God from whom all blessings flow. And what this does is remind us that all of our blessings come from God. What we do isn't just about us, and what we have isn't just from us. It's all from God. God is weaved throughout everything, having a hand in everything. God tills the earth, sows seeds in the soil and in our lives. All blessings flow from God. And it's through the grace of God that our broken lives, our imperfect selves, become good soil once again. Because God will sow seed where God wants to sow seed. God will make good soil where God wants to make good soil. Now we can be hard on Jacob and Esau. They're not exactly perfect people, but they are an example of the human condition. Together they show greed and desire, some traits that we don't necessarily want to exhibit. Esau was willing to sell out for a bowl of stew. He looked at his current physical need instead of what might be to come, instead of demanding that his needs, instead demanding that his needs be fulfilled immediately. But we do that too. Politicians sell votes to win. We ruin the earth because it's easier than the alternative. We buy commodities instead of giving what is God's back to God. We're often unwilling to wait for what we want, and we often are reluctant to wait for God's plan to be revealed. But from beginning to end, God is involved in our lives, just like God was involved in the struggle of Jacob and Esau. God doesn't abandon anyone, but is rather present in an intricate way, even if we can't always see it. Now, like I mentioned earlier, Jacob doesn't exactly seem like he was the best soil. He always wanted what someone else had. But how often do we covet what someone else has? The power or the money of another. But God still works through us. God worked through Jacob, turning norms on their head. That's what is so remarkable here. Things don't always go as expected. God doesn't always work through the people we assume are worthy. God sides with the weak, the second born, the barren, the ones who need help the most even though they might not have a spotless reputation either. We don't always seem like great soil either, but God's grace working within us tills our soil and makes us worthy. God works in unexpected ways, through unexpected people, and with unexpected results. We have to be open to that. God did, after all, send Jesus to us. God does what needs to be done to make good soil. 
We can't always tell what's good or what's rocky from the surface because God is needed to make it good. And God will sow seed where God wants to sow seed. So even though he doesn't seem like the likely candidate, God's favor comes to Jacob. Despite his actions, Jacob is still the recipient of God's grace. God is standing with the weak here and planting where God wants. Reminding us that all that we have, all the blessings of our life flow through God. And that's why we offer back what we have been given. Even though we're not always the best soil, God finds ways to work through us to further the kingdom. Through God's grace, we are saved. And with God, we are able to accomplish great things because we are all recipients of God's grace. We know that those who may not seem like good soil probably are, actually. And we know that we are all made good through God, that we are all equal in God's eyes. God can make everyone good soil. It is through the grace of God that we become that good soil, and for that we owe everything back to God. To God be the glory. Amen.